Hi guys, welcome again to Intellect Medicos, where learning is made easy. I'm Dr. Chirag Madan, intensivist and American Heart Association certified BLS and ACLS instructor. So today we'll discuss about the updates in BLS and ACLS which came up in 2020. So without wasting any time, let's go on to our computer screen or the laptop screen. So the first update which is given by the AHA is the sixth link which has been added to the chain of survival. In 2015, this was the chain of survival having five links. If you can see on the screen, over here IHCA stands for in hospital cardiac arrest whereas OHCA stands for out of hospital cardiac arrest. Now the five links were surveillance and prevention, early recognition and activation of emergency services, immediate high quality CPR, rapid defibrillation and advanced life support and post cardiac arrest care. This was the chain of survival for IHCA patients. Whereas if you come to the OHCA, there is no surveillance and prevention. Directly you have to activate and you have to recognize, right? And giving an immediate high quality CPR, rapid defibrillation, this is the new thing because you have to shift the patient from the site to the nearby hospital. Then the last is obviously advanced life support and post cardiac arrest, arrest care. So this was the chain of survival in 2015. Now in 2020, what AHA has done, they have added a sixth link which is called as recovery. So after post cardiac arrest care, the sixth link is recovery for both IHCA as well as for the OHCA. This is important for your medical examination for mainly your MCQs. Now coming on to the second. Now they have laid more emphasis on the early uh, epinephrine administration. Previously in 2015, this was our algorithm which we used to follow. In case of asystole or PA, directly you have to start the CPR and you have to give epinephrine after starting the CPR. So this was the algorithm which we were actually following for so many years, for past five years. Now in 2020, they have added epinephrine over here in cases of asystole or PA. PA is pulseless electrical activity. So this is a new addition. And then obviously you have to start the CPR and repeat epinephrine every three to five minutes, right? So this was our second update. Coming on to the third. Now there is also an update on the antiarrhythmic to be used in adult cardiac arrest scenarios. Previously in 2015, if you are getting a shockable rhythm again and again, you have to give antiarrhythmic anti to the patient, which was amidoron. Now, in 2020, obviously amidaron is still there, but the new addition is lignocaine or a lidocaine. Coming on to the dose. So amidaron 300 milligram as the first dose and 150 milligram as the second dose. Coming on to the lignocaine dose. So the dose, first dose is 1 to 1.5 milligram per kg as the first dose followed by 0.5 to 0.75 milligram per kg as the second. So this is the new update that they have just added lignocaine in cases where if, if uh, you, you don't have the amidaron with you, right? Then you can go ahead with the lignocaine. So this is or either amidaron or lignocaine. Okay, coming on to the next one. So the fourth update is time of perimortem cesarean is changed in cases of pregnant cardiac arrest scenarios. Previously in 2015, they have said if there is no ROSE, that means if there is no return of spontaneous circulation by 4 minutes, then you have to consider performing immediate cesarean section. But now in 2020, they have just changed the timings of it. If there is no ROSE for 5 minutes, then you have to consider immediate perimortem cesarean delivery. So from 4 minutes, to 5 minutes. They have changed it to 5 minutes. Again, this is more relevant, I mean clinically also and your medical examination. So this is the algorithm for pregnant patient. You have to continue the BLS and ACLS as you have already read the algorithm for the BLS. Continue CPR, defibrillation, ACLS and then consider etiology of arrest. 
This is the mnemonic which has been given by the AHA for the etiology of cardiac arrest in a pregnant ladies. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Now, after that, again, over here, if you can see this point, if no ROSC for 5 minutes, you have to go for immediate cesarean. So, this is an algorithm for pregnant patient which is given in 2020. Uh, fifth update, now two new opioid dissociated emergency algorithms have been added separately for lay rescuers as well as for the trained that is healthcare rescuers. So this is an algorithm for the lay rescuers. First of all, whenever you suspect opioid poisoning, you have to carry on the steps of BLS. Check responsiveness, uh, shout for help, activate emergency services and get naloxone which is very very important and AED if available. Now if the patient is not breathing normally then you have to start the CPR and give naloxone. Obviously we are talking about opioid so you have to give the antagonist for it that is naloxone and use an AED and resume CPR until, until the EMS arrives. Now coming on to the trained rescuer that is healthcare rescuers. You have to follow all those steps but now when the patient is not breathing normally you have to check the pulse if patient has a pulse then you have to just support the ventilation by opening the airway and repositioning providing rescue breaths or a bag match device and give naloxone this is very very important whereas if patient doesn't have a pulse then you have to start the cpr use ad consider naloxone so now there is uh, no such update about this uh, opioid management. The only difference is they have given a separate algorithm for the lay rescuers and separate for the trained or a healthcare uh, rescuers. Coming on to the next one. Changes in cases of post cardiac arrest care. So this is an algorithm for post cardiac arrest care. Obviously whenever you, uh, you have resuscitated a patient there must be a ROSE that is return of spontaneous circulation. After that, you have to manage like a ABC. Manage airway, breathing and circulation. That means the hemodynamics of the patient. Then check the ECG of a patient. After checking everything, you see the neurological status of the patient by whether the patient is following commands or not. If not, that means patient is comatosed. And now the thing which you need to do is TTM very 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 important this TTM this is targeted temperature management in this you have to manage and maintain the temperature of the patient of the deceased from 32 to 36 degrees Celsius for at least 24 hours and then you can obtain CT as well as EEG monitoring so these two points are a new addition Previously in 2015, we didn't have this option. Only the algorithm says if the patient doesn't follow commands, go for TTM. There was no mention about the neuroimaging, the CT or the EEG. So this is a new update in 2020. And if the patient is following command, then you have to do the critical care management in the ICU. Now, coming on to the next update. A new diagram to, to guide neuroprognostication has been added. So this is the diagram, on the x-axis you can see the ROSC, time after ROSC and on the y you can see different parameters like clinical management, imaging, electrophysiology, clinical examination, serum biomarkers. Now we'll see one by one, if we talk about the clinical management, uh, within 24 hours of ROSC you have to go for TTM which we have already talked about. After 24 hours, you can go for rewarming and then limit sedation and analgesia and go for a controlled normothermia. Whereas, if we talk about the imaging, the imaging mentioned by the AHA is head CT for neuroprognostication in first 24 hours and MRI beyond that from 24 to 72 hours and even beyond. Coming on to the electrophysiology, the electrophysiology mentioned is SSEP that is somatosensory evoked potential after 24 hours clinical examination the mention is EEG is used for clinical examination beyond 24 hours and then the serum biomarker which is very very important clinically and for your medical examination 
This NSE is neuron specific enolase which is used as a biomarker after 24 hours for neuroprognostication. Okay, coming on to the next update. In this, they have changed the dose of atropine and dopamine in cases of adult bradycardia algorithm. Previously, they say that dose of atropine in cases of symptomatic bradycardia was 0.5 mg. But now, they have increased this dose to 1 mg IV bolus in cases of symptomatic bradycardia. And the dose of dopamine used to be 2 to 20 micrograms per kg per weight, uh, per kg per minute. But now, they have changed it to 5 to 20 micrograms per kg per minute. So, they have excluded this 2 to 5 range, right? So, now the dose of dopamine is 5 to 20 micrograms per kg per minute. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry for the interruption, guys. So, she is Dr. Shruti, co-founder of Intellect Medigos. Uh, actually, I came here for this huge announcement that we have actually started our second YouTube channel, which is all about YouTube growth tips, business tips and mindset. So, feel free to check that out. The link will be given in the description below. So, okay, guys. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. So, let's get back to BLS and ACLS again. Coming on to the next one. In cases of stroke patient, we used to have this FAS, that is, if any patient has a facial drop, arm drift, speech difficulty, then obviously you, this patient uh, has a more suspicion of having a stroke. Now in this update, they just have added this T after this FAS. T stands for time to call emergency number because stroke is actually an emergency. Then you have to call your emergency number whenever you see any any symptom like this facial drop, arm drift or speed difficulty. You directly have to call the emergency. Tenth, the next update. IV access is preferred over intraosseous. Whereas previously they used to say IV equal to IO. So now update is IV is preferred over IO. The next update is routine use of double sequential defibrillation is not recommended. Previously, there were case report that if a patient is in refractory shock, you, you can attach two set of pairs of uh, defibrillator to the patient. But now they say double sequential def defibrillation is not recommended anymore. Now coming on to the pediatric age group, the rate of breaths increased to one breath every two to three seconds, which comes out to be 20 to 30 breaths. So an uh, infant uh, less than uh, one year, the rate of rescue breath or a breath from advanced airway is 30 per breaths per minute approximately. Next update is curved endotracheal tube is preferred over the uncuffed. Whereas in 2015, they used to say uncuffed uh, tubes are better because of uh, subglottic stenosis. But now curved endotracheal tube is preferred over uncuffed. Coming on to the 14th update. Routine use of cricoid pressure is not recommended during endotracheal tube in intubation. And then the last update is for the babies requiring vascular access at the time of delivery. The umbilical vein is the recommended route. So these are the updates which were given by AHA in 2020 for the BLS and ACLS. These are very important again for your medical examination because they, they lay emphasis more on the updates any kind of examination. I mean, may it be your uh, USMLE, may it be PLAB, may it be MRCP, may it be NEET, maybe any, any exam. So that was all about BLS and ACLS. Thank you so much guys for watching this video and special thanks to Dr. Rakesh Kumar, who is my mentor and a renowned BLS and ACLS teacher. I hope you liked this video. If yes, please hit the like button and share with your colleagues and friends. And do not forget to subscribe the channel to get the updates about my new videos. Thank you so much guys. Take care. Bye-bye.